Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin, <clears throat> and uh, I'll be presenting today uh, along with Nandor about uh, zero trust and uh, workload level identity. Uh, the title is a bit cryptic and a bit difficult, but I uh, hope we can shed some light on, on what we have here. Um, let me start with an introduction, and uh, I let Nandor introduce himself as well. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm working as a product manager uh, for Cisco, uh, actually Cisco's emerging technologies a group called Outshift. Um, previously, I was working at uh, two different startups, and uh, I have a very heavy engineering background, so I just recently uh, moved to uh, the product side of things, but um, I kind of have a deep understanding of how this technology works uh, under the hood. Um, I start with a small introduction of uh, our project and what we think of Zero Trust. Um, what do we think uh, the problem is uh, within the space and how we are trying to solve it. And uh, then later on, I will let uh, Nandor go into the technical details and talk more about um, what we have, uh, what we have implemented, uh, how does it look like. And uh, he'll also do a short demo uh, about uh, the project that we're working on. Uh, but now I'll let Nandor introduce himself as well. Yeah, hi, I'm Nandor. Uh, I'm working also for Outshift Cisco. Uh, together with Marton, I joined Cisco through Banzai Cloud. Um, I'm mainly a software engineer uh, since the beginning of my professional career, which is something like 15, 16 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, yes, and I'm, I'm working mainly in the networking and security areas uh, at Banzai. I was developing uh, uh, the Bank Vaults project, which was basically an infrastructure project for HashiCorp Vault, making it easier to run on Kubernetes and use it more easier in, in a lot of applications. Uh, now I shifted the uh, gears and um, moved to WebAssembly and kernel space. Uh, Based projects and uh, that's here I am. Okay, let's uh, get started. Um, let me start with a with a simple example uh, of a hypothetical attack. Um, this is like a simplified example uh, of how a security breach can happen. Uh, it's not a concrete example uh, like uh, an existing breach or a known breach. Uh, better a simplified example to make it easier to understand uh, what uh, we're aiming at. This example is uh, containing a lateral movement. <clears throat> a lateral movement means that uh, today when uh, an attacker gets into a system, then uh, they usually uh, spend some time there and uh, they are trying to like move laterally uh, within the network or within uh, the infrastructure. Uh, and in the end, the actual exfiltration of data happens uh, some time later uh, after uh, the attacker goes through uh, some steps uh, within that uh, infrastructure. Uh, let me start by, um, by uh, drawing up this uh, attack narrative. Usually uh, it happens by, or it starts by uh, a phishing attack. Maybe uh, some AWS credentials were stolen it can happen uh, like very easily to uh, almost all of us. Maybe uh, some employee was uh, not uh, paying enough attention to some email. Uh, they clicked it uh, and pasted their AWS credentials. Well, it happens uh, even to the best of us. But um, usually, uh, and this is uh, basically where lateral movements are starting, is that... Uh, the attacker's end goal is not to get those AWS credentials. The attacker's goal is to exfiltrate some um, important data from the system. And maybe they doesn't even know beforehand what they are trying to uh, do there or steal there. But uh, they use those AWS credentials to uh, start something uh, in that system to just uh, get there. Maybe they will start a VM inside a security group if... Uh, they have uh, the necessary permissions through those credentials. When they are inside uh, a specific security group or within a specific VPC, uh, they can start some uh, kind of scanning of the internal network, see what's available, 
uh, what ports, what services are available, uh, what uh, they can uh, access from that specific VM. Maybe they find some uh, user management APIs that are supposed to be uh, internal, uh, that is not available from outside of the network. It is only available from inside. Uh, it was meant to be accessed by uh, other services, other microservices, um, especially uh, in today's complex architectures. It is a pretty common pattern uh, to use uh, microservices and just uh, <clears throat> have access from one of those uh, services to an API uh, to the other. Um, if that API is not protected properly uh, inside that system, then an attacker can exploit those trust relations and uh, access this API from uh, the VM that they've started. If they can access uh, this API, uh, they can start the actual data exfiltration by retrieving some kind of uh, user information uh, that was not supposed to be public. And actually, this is the end goal of the attacker, not uh, to get those AWS credentials. <clears throat> it could happen because uh, the attacker was able to do some kind of lateral movement uh, within that uh, internal network, like accessing the user management API from, um, from an arbitrary VM, from an arbitrary script within that same security group. And uh, this is getting pretty common. Uh, threats are evolving. And uh, these are some numbers uh, that are, like, I think, well-known uh, as of today. Uh, and they say things like, uh, it takes seven months uh, in average to uh, actually identify uh, a breach and contain it. It means that an attacker can spend a lot of time in that system before they are even discovered. It also says that uh, almost 60% of security breaches contain lateral movements, and uh, this number is increasing uh, and will increase in the future as well. But on the other hand, uh, only 4% of alerts are even investigated properly. Maybe you have a system that is configured to, uh, to send alerts when uh, it is detecting some kind of uh, malicious behavior or some um, unexpected movements, but... Uh, those, those alerts are um, frequent enough that uh, they won't be investigated properly. So the question uh, occurs naturally, like what can we do to prevent uh, a breach like this? We have a lot of options. Um, it starts from the very basic things like employee awareness against phishing. Just uh, make your employees know that um, do not uh, click any suspicious links and uh, things like that. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can, of course, do a lot of other things like um, um, the principle of least privilege for credentials. So if you have, for example, AWS credentials, you don't give access to um, all kinds of actions uh, in every VPC, maybe uh, contain it to a security group, to, uh, to a subnet. Uh, maybe if you have uh, production systems as well as test systems, uh, do not give everyone uh, access to production systems and production VPCs, for example. Uh, that's a good principle. You can do uh, network segmentation as well. Um, segment your network. Do not put everything inside one uh, specific VPC, one specific subnet. Uh, but rather uh, try to distribute your applications um, and create these segmented groups uh, for each of your uh, <clears throat> uh, microservices. Uh, then, of course, you can set up uh, fine-grained network policies, especially if you have uh, those segmentation uh, things in place, and say, okay, that subnet is not a is uh, or cannot reach. Uh, services from another subnet or uh, things like this. Of course, you could uh, use authentication even for internal services as well. Uh, that could help uh, with my uh, example. If that uh, internal user uh, management system is protected by some kind of authentication, it is not as easy to uh, <clears throat> exploit those uh, trust relations uh, as before. 
or you can uh, use some kind of active monitoring uh, for anomalies. Uh, it is difficult, but uh, there are a lot of systems uh, that are doing just that. So if they detect some kind of uh, suspicious behavior within your network, they will uh, fire up those alerts. But um, we also have problems with these approaches. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do this. Uh, these are all uh, good principles and uh, and things that uh, you should you should do, uh, but they have problems. For example, uh, it doesn't really matter how aware your employees are against phishing; it can happen to everyone. Um, it even happened to me uh, because I was just not paying enough attention, and um, someone was able to uh, use my credit card somewhere even though I couldn't really believe that I will be a victim of uh, of a phishing attack once, but it happened to me as well. Um, this privilege, uh, it means that, okay, you can restrict it, but uh, someone eventually will have access to those systems. And uh, if they are the ones uh, who are uh, the victims, then you will have the same problem. Okay, maybe the chances are, uh, not as big as if you would give uh, everyone privilege uh, to all kinds of systems. Network segmentation, again, it is good, but in the end, it is just limiting the scope. So maybe if someone gets into your system, uh, they won't be able to reach all the other services, but reach only those services that belong to the same uh, network segment. If you're if you're trying to set up network policies, it can be extremely complex. It will probably involve some uh, complex uh, architecture that you need to put in place. If you want to uh, use authentication for internal services, it can get very hard very, very quickly. If you do it one by one and you have, I don't know, hundreds of microservices and you, you're, trying to, you're trying to implement authentication for each of those services one by one, written in a lot of different programming languages in a lot of different frameworks, then it is just hard. It can uh, consume a lot of uh, time and resources uh, of application development teams. <clears throat> and last, uh, active monitoring of anomalies. It is even harder, uh, like creating a system or even buying a system like that. It won't be 100% uh, sure that it will catch all those um, attackers, even if they send alerts, they won't necessarily be investigated properly, as I've just shown in my previous slide. <clears throat> so all these things have problems. And uh, in general, they can be uh, restrictions or they can be uh, reactive uh, solutions. But uh, the question is, do we have something that is able to prevent uh, all those lateral movements uh, and uh, all these uh, things that I've listed. You can think about uh, zero trust here. Uh, zero trust is um, a very heavily uh, hyped something uh, that everyone is talking about. So what if I implement a zero trust strategy in my system? Would it mean that, uh, okay, now I'm, I'm good, I'm protected. It means uh, I won't trust anyone. Uh, I'm implementing it in all parts of my system. But do we really know what uh, zero trust means? Uh, is it like a strategy? Is it a principle? Uh, how do I implement it? How do I execute my zero trust strategy? It uh, is not a simple question. Because effectively, zero trust is... Uh, not an implementation, not even a specification, and um, it cannot really be bought as uh, as one product. I cannot really go ahead and buy something from the market and say, okay, now I've implemented it, I've put it in place, and uh, okay, now my uh, environment is protected and uh, and zero trust is implemented. It it doesn't work like that. Zero trust uh, in itself is just a security principle. And of course, a corresponding strategy that uh, goes with this principle. The principle itself is very simple. Uh, it says, <laughs> sorry, uh, it says, <clears throat> I'm moving from 
a trust but verify model uh, to something that says never trust but always verify. Even if it's uh, end users, even if it's workloads communicating with each other, it is always never trust and uh, always verify. But still, uh, this sentence, uh, this principle uh, doesn't say anything about how do I implement zero trust in my system. But why is zero trust uh, actually a, a big thing or why, why is it a hype today? Um, the answer to that is that it's not necessarily hype. So uh, the zero trust principle itself is, uh, it's kind of like a good thing. And it is driven by uh, the increasingly uh, complex and distributed architectures uh, that are uh, appearing today. If I have um, a simple monolith, then it may not be as big of a problem to protect uh, connections between my workloads. But if I have hundreds of microservices and I have uh, multiple hundreds of connections between these microservices, it can get complex very quickly. Maybe uh, these services are not even deployed to uh, one cloud provider or one network. They are scattered across networks. They are scattered across cloud providers. They use all kinds of uh, mechanism for uh, connections, different protocols, and so on and so on. Because of this, uh, Securing only your uh, network parameter is becoming obsolete. It is just not enough anymore. I just cannot say that, okay, I'm uh, securing everything that is coming from outside, but inside, uh, like everything can happen. It is also because of insider threats or just like what I've said about lateral move movements. Um, then I'm I also uh, in the need of uh, granular granular workload access control, just because how my uh, architecture is becoming complex, I need to uh, control what workload can access what other workload, and uh, just uh, I need to control it granularly instead of just uh, saying some very broad uh, rules. So zero trust is a good thing. Um, it is. Definitely a thing beyond the hype as well. Um, if but if we talk about zero trust, I've usually um, distinguished two different things here. One is is probably the first one is uh, is zero trust that everyone first thinks about when uh, someone says zero trust. It is zero trust network access, and uh, it is a way to. Uh, secure remote access to an organization's applications, services, or data. Um, it is something that uh, could be substituted for a VPN. Uh, so instead of granting access to a whole network with VPN, um, granting access to uh, services and uh, I'm controlling it through policies uh, by clearly defined access policies. Uh, this is usually... Uh, what someone thinks about zero trust. <laughs> uh, but there is another area uh, about zero trust and it is uh, workload to workload zero trust. That's uh, how we usually call it. It means that uh, when, I'm, uh, when I have multiple services in like one VPC, one network environment, I need to uh, control how I can access one workload uh, from the other. And this is basically the part that uh, we will talk more about today. Uh, for that part, I there are multiple solutions today on the market. The first one is micro-segmentation. This is uh, the more common uh, application uh, for zero trust. It uh, is usually present in more traditional networks. Uh, it uh, is usually network-based. It means that uh, I'm dividing the network into segments and applying security controls to each of those segments. And these segments can be uh, as small as, as one uh, workload that is running on a machine. It is for sure reducing attack surface, uh, but <laughs> it still doesn't encrypt traffic. It uh, doesn't work well in Kubernetes, at least not as a first-class citizen. And uh, 
it can get very complex very quickly when you're setting up policies in a changing environment. The second solution, uh, especially in Kubernetes, uh, are service meshes, because service meshes effectively implement uh, a zero trust environment if uh, you turn on uh, MTLS connections between your services. But service meshes also have problems. Uh, one is that they only realistically work on Kubernetes, uh, not necessarily outside of it. Um, service meshes often mix responsibilities between network and security teams. So uh, like MTLS connections and zero trust can belong to security teams, but on the other hand, a service mesh can also be used to um, uh, generate telemetry and also to um, uh, control your network flows, uh, maybe do some load balancing or some A-B testing and stuff like that. Um, it is not uh, very granular. Um, I mean, it can be enough in a lot of situations, but not in all of these situations. Uh, it means that uh, a service mesh will trust everything running uh, in the pod behind the sidecar. So if someone is able to get uh, into your pod, then uh, they will still be able to uh, exploit those trust relations. And of course, it comes with uh, the proxy hell, uh, sidecar proxies, node level proxies, uh, routing traffic through these proxies. It can be a pain. And um, more and more people realize how uh, complex uh, they are, especially that uh, they often uh, doesn't need all the functionality of service meshes. Maybe they would only want to use it for MTLS, but uh, it means that uh, it comes with uh, all the other um, like proxy help. So uh, third, and uh, I'm talking a bit uh, too much as I'm trying to uh, uh, do it quick. Uh, third, and this is uh, where we are trying to get uh, is uh, kernel level identity and encryption. It means that, okay, we can maybe take the ideas from a service mesh. Uh, we should do MTLS uh, between those services. If I can do automatic MTLS, I'm protected against those uh, lateral movements that are happening from workload to workload. Uh, but I don't need all the other uh, things that a service mesh has. And maybe I can also use it outside of Kubernetes because if I'm um, uh, moving all these things down to kernel level, it means that it will work everywhere where uh, a Linux is uh, the host. Uh, but again, even though it uh, works on the kernel level, if uh, I'm running on Kubernetes, I can use some kind of connectors or metadata collectors to, uh, to get Kubernetes metadata and uh, actually write policies and do access control based on that information. And uh, compared to uh, micro-segmentation, it also does encryption. Uh, so it's not just um, um, like segmentation, but also encrypted traffic. Uh, it can also be application and network agnostic. It doesn't really matter if uh, or how your uh, workload reaches uh, the other workload. If uh, it can reach it, then uh, our uh, kernel level identity can, uh, can work there. Uh, it can also be completely transparent to the application. If I'm implementing it in kernel space, it doesn't really matter if I'm running my application on top. They You won't have to uh, uh, recompile your application, not even restart or redeploy your application. It will just uh, work completely transparently. And this is basically the idea behind Camlet. Uh, this uh, is a new open source project uh, by Outshift uh, to automate uh, kernel space workload identity access control and encryption. And uh, now we can switch to the more technical part and I'll let uh, Nandor talk about Camlet uh, a bit more. Um, okay. So yeah, okay, so I'm taking over the screen share and uh, try to present what is Camlet. Okay, so as Martin mentioned, uh, 
Camelot is a is a kernel based solution. And first of all, I will start with an architecture diagram, which hopefully will clear things up how it wants to work on on the Linux kernel. So kernel uh, the, uh, is a is a is a hard topic. The Linux kernel is a hard topic, but uh, we would like to attack it in a in in a way so users can consume it. Uh, uh, as as easy as possible. So for example, we have a very nice installer which is a one liner and installs the main components of Camblet and starts up a vanilla installation which can be configured easily. Camblet consists of an agent, as Martin mentioned, which is basically a user space component and consists of a kernel space component called the Camblet driver, uh, which you can see on the bottom on a, on a Linux node. And uh, what we do, what we do here is the driver does the heavy work and the agent does the controlling work like uh, uh, distributing policies, uh, capturing metadata about processes, and the driver does the the data plane stuff like encryption, um, authentication, and policy enforcement. And, and the authentication is uh, through to TLS certificates. I will come back to this slide later on because uh, it can clear things up. Okay, the core of Camlet is in the kernel. The complete TLS handshake happens in kernel space. Uh, we have our private keys generated after the installation and they never leave the kernel space. We are using standard TLS, so no outside magic be, uh, besides the industry standard TLS. And we use the KTLS uh, component of the kernel, which is basically kernel TLS. Uh, it does the heavy work for doing encryption on each and every Linux host in a very efficient way. So also involving network cards, uh, if, if the hardware is supported by the Linux kernel to offload TLS encryption as much as possible. So not doing heavy CPU work, which can be offloaded to a network card. Unencrypted traffic never leaves the kernel space. So basically, user space components don't have to use TLS uh, in, in the user space level. So you don't have to uh, configure certificates because the TLS encryption and authentication will happen down in the kernel space. But we send to the, the encrypted traffic there to the next host, and the next host kernel driver will unencrypt it and send to the user space process in a very transparent but uh, non attackable way to your next application. And if your application already uses TLS, um, we have a, uh, basically a skip through uh, uh, checkpoint where basically you can let won't encrypt, re encrypt the TLS traffic again. We just use the policy enforcement and the handshake process down in the kernel space. Okay, so this socket, which basically a plain TCP socket, it gives us a level, uh, user kernel level identity and uh, only to those processes and only to those processes and none anymore uh, where you have described them with policies. Uh, alone, the kernel space driver, the kernel module, can't uh, work alone. So as I mentioned in the first uh, architecture diagram. We need a user space component, which is basically the driver, which sits on the host in user space and has, and communicates uh, continuously with our kernel driver in a secure way to collect metadata about the processes that you are trying to target with, with Camblet. And for example, it, we have connectors for Docker, we have connectors for Kubernetes, and first of all, we have connectors for plain uh, uh, processes that are running on the bare host. So uh, you don't have to use um, orchestration environment, so it's not a must, but we support them. So as I Marta mentioned, the, since we are running a kernel driver there, it works on orchestration drivers which run on the Linux kernel. Nomad, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, uh, you name it. But we also support plain processes. So, and it's fully transparent. You don't have to rebuild and re reuse your application, uh, sorry, re rebuild and uh, restart or redeploy your application since 
we override the TCP protocol inside the kernel to give uh, TLS connection uh, to to your TCP socket. Okay, how we achieve identity and access policies there? Um, again, we are not using uh, something uh, new, but uh, we are using uh, piggybacking on SPFI IDs. So we bake SPFI IDs into the certificates of your applications. Each and every application has its own SPFI ID. One application have can have multiple identities, so multiple SPFI IDs through different uh, policies that you described. So it it can be uh, that it, it can be that that your application talks with GitHub uh, with one identity and talks to your backend application with another identity. Uh, you can describe it easily in our YAML-based policies in Hamlet, and all those PPU IDs are present in those certificates. Identities are defined through metadata selectors, so it's very easy to create a group of applications with, with these kind of policies that uh, you can describe in Hamlet. I will show you later on. And you can include metadata uh, from environment specific elements like uh, Kubernetes labels or Docker tags or things like that. Okay, we need service discovery in Camlet in, in to make it possible to discover to describe applications that you would like to connect from client applications. So service discovery helps basically the discovery of services that your client applications are trying to connect. So basically these are the server applications. Since we are on the kernel level, we know only IP addresses. So somehow we need to translate uh, IP addresses back to application names or host names as, uh, as you wish. So since people understand host names better and machines understand IP addresses better, so we need to do a mapping. So this provides us some DNS type functionality in kernel space. It defines which workloads are part of the system. So, but you don't need to define SPFI IDs here. This is only for resolving IP addresses. This is currently the user's responsibility to describe the system, uh, but automatic connectors uh, like for Docker Swarm and Kubernetes are in the making because Docker and Kubernetes already provides all the information that we need. We just need to pull down that information. And since Cambridge is a young project, and uh, currently we are trying to find the most easiest way to do that, so it's not implemented yet, but in the books. How do I use Cambridge? As I mentioned, it's pretty easy to install. Uh, we have a website where you can find I or one line and install. You need to install Camblet on each and every host that you would like to involve in the zero trust data plane that Camblet defines through the policies. If you install it, as I mentioned, it will install a kernel module, compile it onto the target machine directly, and sign it with the DKMS uh, key. So you have a fully uh, open source kernel module running on your machine but that you can check the code and uh, it's totally transparent. And also the insta uh, installation installs the kernel agent, which uh, the, the modules agent, which runs in user space uh, in one instance on each and every node. After installation, you need to write and distribute your policies, uh, which I mentioned, and I will show you in a short demo, I just playing YAML files. And also you need to distribute your service discovery files now, but on later on when we have the Kubernetes operator and connector that will do this automatically, it won't be a task anymore. Okay, so it's a demo time. I will go to my terminal. Uh, here I have a terminal, which is uh, which uh, consists of four windows. I will show uh, different things parallelly. So first of all, this is an Ubuntu machine, nothing special. Uh, only special thing that Camblet is already uh, installed in this machine, and I will uh, show two different two different scenarios here. One which is running on the bare host, and the other one is running in Kubernetes. 
on, on the bare host, I uh, will run an Nginx server, the plain Nginx installation, which returns index.html on the root. And I will attack it with curl. I mean, get the host with curl. Okay, so first of all, I will do, do an, sorry. I will do an ngrep on the, an, an, a network grep, so you can see what is happening basically. I will start Nginx. Oops. Okay, and I will show you my simple policy here. I have a policy file already prepared because we have a short demo time only. And this is all commented out. So it, this means that currently Camblet is installed, but it's not active. So we, since we have no selectors defined, it will not intercept any kind of traffic. Okay, I will hit the Nginx server that I'm running. And in the network graph, you should see that it's running through plain text. Yeah, I just got the return from curl localhost 8000. And this is the plain HTML document. Welcome to Nginx. And as you can see, the whole traffic went in plain text. So the curl client opened Nginx ports there. It executed uh, a plain text HTTP request. And the Nginx ser server from port 8000 returned to the curl client the index HTML file in plain text. Okay, let's do some magic there and uh, try to encrypt this traffic. What I'm doing is I'm commenting out the selector for Nginx and see what happens. What should happen here is that Cambrid already took uh, the engine export, and if I try to HTTP get it again, it won't work. Why is that? Because uh, Nginx now is on MTLS, but curl isn't, since it isn't described or our policy. But we what would like to do is that they both should communicate on MTLS together. Uh, I, I can show you. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, if I open the, the, the engine export with OpenSSL as client, we already had a handshake, but since we couldn't provide any certificates, uh, since engine is, wants to have MTLS already, as Martin described, in zero trust way, the connection closes. Okay, so go to the policy file and create a selector also for curl. As you can see, the selector is very simple. I, we are having a named text, which you can find the documentation. I have a process name, which is curl, and it will, uh, Cambridge will find all processes which are called curl and provide them MTLS. We have a workload ID for curl, it's called curl and simple. We have a strict MTLS mode and allows spiffy IDs, which is or spiffy and or default trust domain, and also for Nginx. Both of them are having allowed spiffy IDs. This means that the spiffy ID check is bidirectional. So also Eng Nginx checks that curl wants to communicate with it. And also curl is checking that is communicating with Nginx. Let's see if it works. Check and grab. Yeah, we got back the index HTML. And as you can see in ngrep, the whole traffic is uh, mumbo jumbo. So it's encrypted now with MTLS. But as you can see, I used simple plain localhost. So if I make it more clear, so this is not HTTPS, but simple HTTP. But behind the scenes with Camblet, 
it got uh, transformed to HTTPS through TLS. And uh, we got back the file. In the policy file, we can do uh, other interesting things. For example, in the upper part, I can show you that it works also in Kubernetes. I'm having a vault and an Alpine pod. Uh, I will uh, connect to the vault pod from the Alpine pod with the same curl that I was using here. Okay. I'm commenting out some stuff from the policy file. Since I have two new components, I need to comment out the last two components that I was saved there. This is a selector for Alpine. It will do empty, it, it, it will provide, find the curl process in my Alpine container. It will give it a workload ID called Kubernetes curl and do a strict MTLS uh, handshake with the allowed spiffy ID Kubernetes world, which is the other component, which is the vault in the vault container in, in the vault pod having a certificate uh, with the workload ID, spiffy ID, Kubernetes world, and the connection is still strict MTLS checking and the spiffy ID it allows to itself is curl. Okay, let's save this policy. And if I go to the Alpine pod, you will see I have a curl there. And let's try to check what is in the world. What, how is world doing on the pass? Oops. I'm having some issues. Uh, okay, I'm back. Mm -hmm. Now it's there. Okay, so as you can see, I was hitting again a plain traffic, uh, a plain HTTP endpoint with curl. Oops. Sorry, I, I, I wrote the S and it's, it's not working. Okay, with HTTP it's working again. So as, as you can see, I, I hit a plain HTTP endpoint from an Alpine container to another Vault container, which by default doesn't have any uh, certificate set up by itself. As you can see, it's a Vault instance. And as you can see, it's, 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 it's the dev Vault instance uh, listening with the basic Vanilla config, and it doesn't have any kind of certificate set up. But we still got with ngrep encrypted traffic since Camblet selectors and uh, providing of TLS certificates also work through Kubernetes. And I think basically that was my demo and also my slides. Uh, I, I would suggest you to check out. Uh, Camblet on GitHub, Cisco Open Camblet, and also on the Camblet IO site where you can find the installer and the documentation. And if you have any questions, please ask them now. And that was it. Okay. In the QA, I can see one question Is Camblet open source? Yeah, it's open source. As I mentioned, it's on GitHub. Cisco open, Cisco dash open, Camblet. What is the trust assumption? Host kernel is trusted to be not compromised and there is no privilege escalation by container, for example. Yeah. Yes, uh, since we are uh, running in kernel space. I think it's a it's a very interesting question. But uh, since we are running in kernel space, yes, the kernel doesn't can't be compromised. Uh, this is a assumption by us, and uh, 
also it's an it's an uh, assumption by us that uh, since we are open source, you have the chance to uh, verify that we are not uh, injecting any kind of suspicious code to your to your uh, kernel. And uh, the other thing is that uh, basically you have to know which what kind of processes are running on your kernel. So it's a good time to. Uh, browse through all your VMs and check what kind of processes you are uh, running. Uh, I think a lot of infra teams know, but a lot, other lot of infra teams doesn't know how many interesting processes are there from unattended upgrades, for example, on Ubuntu. A lot of people don't know if they are running there or not. So Camblet can give you uh, a good idea what kind of processes you are running since the logs uh, that Camblet uh, emits will go through all TCP connections that are going in and out from your system. So uh, maybe it's a good feature that we could do a network map based on Camblet logs later on. Will you share? Okay. Will you share this demo code? It's very cool. I want to test it locally and show it to my team. Yes, uh, the demo code, the the policies uh, are not yet on GitHub, but uh, I will share it. Uh, I, I I will put a link to the readme of the of the repo. Uh, otherwise, the whole stuff is open source. Is this comp contributing to Camblet? Yes, uh, we are working at Cisco, and uh, we did Camblet. So the answer is yes. Is TCP specific solution, or is it also applicable to quick UDP or Unix domain socket communication? Currently, it is TCP specific. We already know how to make it uh, UDP uh, compatible as well. So uh, since Quick is using UDP uh, heavily, uh, probably we need to test it there and find the solution for the first part of the second question. So we'll make it Quick compatible. So UDP is in the making. Uh, currently, it is TCP specific. Yeah. So I will share the quotes as quick as I can on the Camblet page. But you can, well, the, in the documentation, you can find cool examples like this. So, and also in the samples of the agent code. So I suggest to go through that in, in the meantime. I think that was all. Yeah, thank you everyone. Just to, just to add one uh, little sentence. So. Uh, yes, Camblet is uh, implemented uh, within Cisco. We've started the project and uh, it is actually just starting. So it it is in its early phases. Uh, you can expect some uh, bugs and uh, some uh, interesting behaviors, maybe, hopefully not. Uh, but uh, you can support us by going on GitHub, uh, give us a star, uh, try it out locally. Uh, run it in your dev environment, uh, ask questions, uh, open an issue on GitHub, uh, maybe even fix uh, some uh, issues and submit a PR. So we are happy to receive any kind of contributions uh, because we just want to uh, make this project get started and uh, it would help us a lot. Otherwise, thank you. Uh, okay, that's one, thank you. Uh, um, I don't know, maybe uh, Rohit can answer this question, but uh, you can always contact us on GitHub. Uh, that may be the easiest way to do it. Uh, I think we, uh, that exactly. is live. Yeah, we have I'm... a team at camblat.io uh, email address as well. Uh, but yeah, Rohit, if you want to answer. This. Yes, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks everybody. So I was actually a fly on the wall. Uh, I'm in the marketing group at... Uh, outshift uh to your question yes you can reach out to us uh as a follow-up uh if i know who the person asked uh you know if you have a specific question uh, we can always reach out to you alfred right 
So uh, I think uh, if you're able to share your email ID, uh, we can always reach out with, uh, you know, the specific question and, you know, the person who can answer that. So yeah, that's, I think, uh, I hope that addresses the question, Alfred. Uh, glad to reach out to you. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in, in the readme of the repos, you can find links to Slack as, um, I think, and also email addresses. So, but uh, we will double check and put everything into the readme with the examples as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Martin and Nandor, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.